You're on. My name is Beverly Sanders, and today is Tuesday, June 25th, 2019. I'm visiting today with, with Roy Bendure at McFarland United Methodist Church in Norman, Oklahoma. Joe Sanders will be assisting with the recording equipment, and sometimes he may put in a question. This interview is for the historical records of McFarland Memorial United Methodist Church, as well as the Voices of Oklahoma United Methodism Project of the Oklahoma Conference Oral History Research Program, which is coordinated through the Commission on Archives and History with the support of the Oklahoma United Methodist Historical Society. Roy, we'd sure thank you for coming tonight today and uh, take the time out of your day to come talk with us. Uh, we've been, as we've been visiting before, I'm really looking forward to this because we've already heard some good stories as long as we don't forget to tell those. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so would you just start by telling us about yourself, uh, where you're from, where you're born, your family, uh, just anything, anything okay. like that? Well, I was born in Kansas City, Kansas, and um, soon after I was born, my parents moved to Corpus Christi, Texas, and I grew up there, went to high school, junior college. Um, married the preacher's daughter, uh, Judith Billman, oh. and uh, we moved to northeast Arkansas. Her father was a pastor in Blytheville, Arkansas. We moved up there and uh, worked with the youth and the church at the time and uh, finished my degree at Arkansas State University mm -hmm. and was there until 78 when I had a job offer through the uh, State Department of Health here and uh, I took that job and we moved to Norman in 1978. Mm -hmm. So you were already in Norman uh, when you, before you came to uh, be the youth director here? Yes, and in fact we were Presbyterian uh -huh. and um, we had visited one of the Presbyterian churches at mm -hmm. the time and we're going to go to First Presbyterian the next Sunday and visit it when the associate pastor at McFarland, who was Dan Patman at the time, visited us thinking we were the former residents there oh. and uh, my wife was particularly taken with him and he said that he thought we would enjoy McFarland so we thought well we'll go see what McFarland is like and mm -hmm. we liked it so much we stayed for many many years. <laughs> I believe Dan Patman was the kind of young young one that had twin Yes twin, he did. Twins, okay. Yeah. Uh, now just as a sideline here I'm always curious about um, email addresses your Toys by Roy does sound familiar and like it should have a particular significance. Does it have a story behind it? Well, I have lots of hobbies um, and um, uh, collecting and restoring antiques mm -hmm. is one of them I still pursue. Uh, uh -huh. At the time I was into model trains and so I called it Toys by Roy oh, okay. and I, I would fix up some and put them out on the internet and under Toys by Roy. Mm -hmm. So that became my email address. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm always curious about the ones that seem like they have some, some particular reason that there must have been a reason for that. Uh, we already got when you first came to Norman and how you got to McFarland, then I know you, okay, you were telling us that you had come to McFarland there about 78, you said? Yes. Did you also go to a Sunday school class at that time? Did you? Yes. Uh, Dan Patman encouraged us to try the searcher's class, mm -hmm. and we did. and. Uh, very much enjoyed it and the searchers became our social group and uh, our way to sort of become established mm -hmm. in Norman. We, yeah. we didn't know a single person. Uh -huh. So the searchers became our social group as well as our uh, Sunday school. I have heard a lot of people say that, that searchers class has people, a lot of people with a lot of different uh, interests, a lot of, into a lot of different things. Um, what, were, what were things, what was going on at McFarland at that time? What kind of things were going with the with the congregation? Uh, any big campaigns, a building campaign? I believe like at that, that time the uh, there was some fundraising and some planning to uh, uh, refurbish the sanctuary, mm -hmm. to remodel it or restore it, uh -huh. as well as the organ. I believe was all in that time period, and all these Sunday school rooms and all these floors were in bad need of of upgrading. I believe that was when that was all going on. Okay. I, I, I think so. I believe I just put it together. We have a picture that I believe is at the end of that renovation with people out on the steps re releasing balloons and a whole big celebration. Right. Yeah. Right. So, um, so let's get right right to the the thing that we remember you most for is your being the youth director here at McFarland. And tell us about how you came to be in that position. 
Um, well, my wife was on a, a committee where they were looking for a youth director. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had worked with youth at various churches we had gone to all of our married life. Mm -hmm. And she came home one evening and said, I think I found a job for you. <laughs> and when I heard about it, I thought, well, I was kind of unhappy where I was at that point in my career. And uh, so I thought I would look into it. Mm -hmm. And as they say, one thing led to another. I interviewed, uh, Phil Finn was the pastor at that mm -hmm. time. And um, my understanding was that uh, the youth program was in dire need of some something of uh, mm -hmm. some some assistance mm -hmm. and uh, I kind of saw that as possibly a challenge and uh, fulfilling and so I applied and and I was hired. Well I've been trying to mentally put together uh, the, the sequence of youth directors. Uh, do you know uh, who was here immediately before or anything who followed you? Or anything? Uh, Jerry Benson. Jerry Benson. Okay, Benson yes. was okay. Um, the youth, the youth department had um, lost a lot of kids. Uh, there was a handful, maybe 12 or 15, that still kind of hung on. And they were like Jerry's kids, you know, they were, uh, mm -hmm. it was, um, uh, that was about all that was going on here and that the potential mm -hmm. was much larger. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, when when he left, uh, Phil and I had a long talk about what he saw as the real need in the in the youth program, and so we we put our heads together. I was prim primarily a uh, a meeting planner at my previous vocation, hey, and what so kind of planner? meeting uh, event planning. Oh, okay. And so um, that was kind of my my program was my mm -hmm. my skill set. So putting together a program was also appealing to Phil. He wanted something more concrete. Yeah, and I know Joe has mentioned from time to time while he was on the finance committee that at some point they had had come to a, a decision that the emphasis was going to be on youth, that, the, 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 that they were going to work to spend bend our 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 budget to, with an emphasis on youth to try to do something with the youth program. Yes, that's, that's correct. Uh, that meeting was kind of a, a watershed moment for me because uh, at that point I saw that the church wanted to put their money where their mouth was, if you will. They wanted to invest in the youth. Mm -hmm. And at the time it seemed like an extraordinary amount of money. I think it was $3,000 or something, <laughs> where before it was several hundred. Mm -hmm. And so it was quite a step yeah. up. And it actually gave me some tools to to work with, so it was a real help. Yeah, I was what I was uh, when I was asking about. I was wondering just I know that in the past, you know, when I, back when Joe and I were were youth, uh, there was no such thing as paid youth directors. They were all everybody was volunteers. And in fact, I think they were still all volunteers when we got back here in 1976. So I'm wondering, do you have any idea when they when they actually you know, came to the position of? Uh, paid youth director. No, they had I don't. Youth director here when we come back in '76. Jane, they had Jane uh, Robaugh. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Anyway, let's get back to that's that's getting off the subject. Um, okay, and you've already talked some about what the youth were doing at that time, what kind of a group they had, and what kind of activities they were they were doing, what they had going on. Well, they had a, a small, intimate group. Um, unfortunately many of the young people that were in that or that group uh, had drug problems mm -hmm. and um, uh, there wasn't a whole lot in the way of program going on at that time mm -hmm. and um, when when I took the program over it was very painful because the youth were so attached to the previous youth director they had a hard time adjusting mm -hmm. to me yeah. uh, I was probably more mature. I was older than the previous youth yeah. director. I think I was probably in my 40s. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they wanted some young person. The kids at the time wanted that. But uh, the very first MYF meeting that we had uh, to introduce me to the, the youth in the church, we had over 100 show up that Sunday evening. And it totally overwhelmed us because we didn't have enough food. We had a, 
uh, MYF supper that we had prepared for 20 or so, and we had over 100 show up, and uh, we had to really start rethinking, you know, and, and some of the youth that were previously involved with the previous youth director were amazed that there were so many young people in the church. They didn't know there so were that many. That's what, that was going to be my question, sort of, were they, were they here to protest their other director leaving or, the, or you're coming, or to <laughs> celebrate your coming? Because uh, I, I asked that in seriousness because we did have some occasion at one point when the youth in mass uh, protested against something, and I've forgotten how just exactly what the situation was. But yeah. I don't know that there was much of a protest. There were some uh, resistance at first with this first group. Mm -hmm. However, because of the influx of so many new uh, young people in the uh -huh. church, uh, they became the minority and mm -hmm. they, they felt a little threatened because they were the power base and now they were the minority in the youth group. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first things that uh, I found myself into was that the previous youth director had planned a ski trip and back in those days, in order to have enough money to, to charter a bus and all that, mm -hmm. they opened up the ski trips to Colorado uh, from anybody in, in Norman, any young oh. person. And so uh, when we had that happen, two-thirds of the people that showed up for the ski trip were not part of our church or my youth group. Mm -hmm. And we had some problems. We had, I some, would say. we had some behavior problems, and there was some drug use on the bus. Mm -hmm. And these were not people who related to me in any way. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was an eye-opener for me. We got back, I first met with Phil, and I said, uh, if we do a ski trip again, it'll only be McFarland Youth, because uh, they didn't have any relationship, no respect for me. Yeah. And I wanted it to be a church trip. Yeah. And so the next year when we planned the ski trip, we had a big meeting, and all of the kids from all over Norman that were not part of our group showed up and I announced to them that we would have mandatory worship services every morning and uh, that we would, uh, you know, behave like a, a youth group and there was some wailing and gnashing of teeth <laughs> and I remember saying the words, we are a church and I'm not going to apologize for that. <laughs> I'm not here to entertain you. If you want to be part of our group and there's an attendance requirement, you have to attend so many MYFs in order to be able to go on the trip. You're welcome to join us, but if that's not what you want to do, then you'll need to look somewhere else for a ski trip. We had a smaller but very successful ski trip the next year. And that year. was on your, your second second year? Uh, yeah, that was probably in 1982 was our ski trip, wow. yeah. So there's, it's not, not all that easy being a being a youth director, is it? No. <laughs> did he, of course, did anybody ever say it was easy? <laughs> well, I've, I've thought many times afterwards that being the youth director here was the most challenging and frustrating job I've ever had, but probably the most rewarding as well. Okay, you've talked about ski trips. I know that the big one that we want to talk about, of course, is how the, uh, the youth mission trips came about. But before we do that, uh, Tell us about some other particular activities that you would do with the kids. Uh, well, Sunday evening we had to uh, really beef up. The program was, I'm going to say, virtually non-existent. So recruiting youth sponsors and training them and having a program for the different levels of junior high and mm -hmm. senior high groups uh, was one of the priorities. And so to find ways to attract them to come on Sunday evening was always uh, a challenge. I can remember one event where we had, I had just purchased some guttering to put on my house at home and somehow in my mind I thought we could use this in some way for our MYF dinner and so we had a 60 foot banana split one night. <laughs> we lined the gutter with aluminum foil uh -huh. And we had all kinds of adults ready with ice cream and bananas. And so after the MYF supper, we had a 60-foot banana split. And uh, yeah, it was a gimmick, but it drew kids out out of curiosity. And I found that if I had to compete against uh, TV, and back then it was like uh, walkie, you know, the, where they listen yeah. to music and uh -huh. stuff like that, uh, I had to be creative in order to, to get them to come and see what was going on. I have a feeling I have seen a picture of that 
banana split. I bet we've got it in the uh, in the church papers you in the archives. I think I bet we have that picture. I've there. included some in a couple in the uh -huh. group of pictures. So anything think about some other uh, activities? Um, Sounds like you got a bunch of them. Well. Like I said, program was was my specialty. And, so. and you, pardon me, you you did mention that you also you had from the junior high all the way through senior high. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, for the first couple of years, I tried to do all of that by myself, and uh, even though I was uh, middle aged, it was just about to wear me down. And so I finally decided I needed help, and the church wasn't in a position to, uh, in the 80s, the economy wasn't very good, and so uh, they weren't in a position to hire any assistance. So I was able to find a, a couple of people who um, I could train and turn MYF over to them at a certain point. Mm -hmm. So what we did on Sunday night is we would have an, an MYF uh, supper, and that even had to change because when you change from feeding 15 and start feeding 70 or 80 every mm -hmm. Sunday night, that became a big deal. Sharon Ray took over that responsibility oh. and she loved it. Uh -huh. And she loved cooking, she loved the kids, uh -huh. and she so, had it all down like an assembly line, you know. <laughs> we got them through the line and get them fed. And I'm not sure exactly, but she had two boys herself that were... She did. So we had, I don't know if they were in that age group, but uh, they, they were, were a little bit younger, a little bit older. Uh, I think at some point both of them were in the youth group mm -hmm. when I was here. I know I had both of them in school, in, in my math yes. classes. So, so uh, at, what we would do then is we would have a program, and we, I had... Uh, and now, uh, recognizing that technology has moved a long way since the 1980s, uh, I made slides to sing along with, and I would have recorded music. And I would put these slides up, and then we would sing along with them. Uh, I would take pictures of weekly activities that the youth were involved in, and I'd have those developed and show those at times. And the, the youth would enjoy seeing themselves up on the screen as well. So I had a, a general program with, which included the, both the junior high and the senior highs at one time. We'd have the, fam the uh, MYF dinner. And then we would split into two. The junior highs would go to their MYF group and the senior highs with theirs. So that's kind of how we fell mm -hmm. into a program in the evenings. Mm -hmm. One in particular that stands out, I was trying to teach the young people how important and how valuable uh, religious freedom was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how I rem remember contacting the Norman Police Department uh, but they had a few officers who volunteered to come on Sunday evening and arrest us for having a religious activity. And uh, so we had planned ahead of time when we were singing these songs that were on the slides. At one point, a certain song would be playing. The police came in, raided us, if you will, <laughs> put me in handcuffs. Um, Phil Finn, Reverend Finn showed up and they put him in handcuffs. And we had a little discussion about how important religious freedom was. And then we broke into small groups. And many of the, the members of the Norman Police Department led these groups in discussing how important it is to not take your faith for granted. Yeah. yeah can you yeah, see this, that at all from there? Oops. This was an article that was placed in the Norman transcript. Uh, this was October 1st, 1982. And it, it tells about all that, that went on that night. Yeah, yeah. So that was just one of many different events uh -huh. that took place from time to time. Well, if we think of more events as we go along, we can always come back to these. I love these stories about the, about the things that happened here with the, with the youth. Uh, but let's go to the idea of mission trips, these, these uh, major mission trips. Uh, was the church, were they, were you doing, it at the, when you first came, were you doing any even minor local mission, going out and actually working? Uh, Not to my knowledge. You know, Joe and I arrived here in 1976 with a, uh, not quite, with, with a teenage son and a one preteen. And at that time, it seemed, as you said, the main purpose of the program was to entertain the kids. And that's why I'm wondering, did it, was it, were the, did you, were you already doing something, or at that point, 
where uh, you talked about your MYF and how, how you had to, had to get a program through there. One of the realizations that came through to me in working with young people was that they were, not, I'm going to use a term, they were self-centered or even selfish, not in such a bad way, but they just didn't have a realization for the world beyond their mm -hmm. own lives, uh -huh. you know, even here in the community. And uh, I had been doing some reading of, of what some other youth groups have been doing in the way of service projects, and I thought, this is a way to push them beyond their comfort zone, to see what the other world is like, people who are needy, and make them appreciate more of what they had. And so we put together a, uh, an Appalachia service project, and I think that was 1981, and uh, we took a group, I don't recall how many, I'm going to say in the neighborhood of 40, mm -hmm. to uh, Oil Springs, Kentucky, and that was a very financially devastated area. Mm -hmm. And um, the kids came back with a whole different outlook on life. Mm -hmm. And uh, they enjoyed it. One of the things we did before we went is to have local service projects to sort of prepare us uh -huh. for that. One of those projects, by the way, was cleaning the, the lot that used to be next door where now Fen Hall is, mm -hmm. is located. It was terribly overgrown, had bamboo and mm -hmm. the, the weeds were, were knee high. And yeah. Were the houses already gone? There? there was a house there and there were, was a lady, I believe, that lived there with lots of dogs, if I recall. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I went to her and asked her if she would mind if on a Saturday morning if the youth would come over and clean her property free of charge. Mm -hmm. And she was glad to have us. Mm -hmm. um, and we had uh, probably 50 or 60 youth on that Saturday morning show up and it made such a difference. I have to believe that in some way that led to us being able to purchase that property later. I imagine. But it was a practice for the real thing of going to mm -hmm. Appalachia. Mm -hmm. So you really had to introduce the idea of one of the things that you should be, the youth should be doing was service. You know, I really found that the parents were supportive. Mm -hmm. um, they, they know their own children, their own young people, mm -hmm. and uh, they wanted them to have those experiences. So uh, I had a lot of support from parents, and many of them volunteered to go with us. Uh -huh. uh, how many days was your Appalachia trip? Um, counting travel time probably. over and back, probably uh, nine days, ten days, something oh, like that. Good long one. Yeah. We were usually in Appalachia for four to five days of really hard work. Mm -hmm. And I remember Oil Springs, the temperature was 106 degrees and we were doing roofing work. <laughs> so that was, yeah, it wasn't pleasant by any stretch. Yeah. This question that I had here is kind of what we've already been talking about. It said, uh, how did you ever even consider taking large groups of youth off like that on a mission trip as your responsibility. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I just felt that it was the, the right thing to do. And uh, once I kind of dis, I, I, I will step back a bit and say one of the first things that I implemented was a youth council. I had two of them, a junior high youth council uh -huh. and a senior high youth council, and those were elected positions. Mm -hmm. And the youth really took the job seriously, and we would have meetings where we would discuss what things they wanted to do, what things that uh, were possible for them to do in the next year. We planned a whole year of activities. Mm -hmm. Many times we'd take a retreat with the youth council, and we would do these planning on the retreat. Mm -hmm. And I'd give them, we'd have three number of just fun things to do. Uh -huh. We'd have like three or four service projects and three or four educational projects. And then they would have to choose and fill in the slots. And uh, Appalachia was one of those that they chose to do. Of course, any time the kids could take a road trip, they were for it, you mm -hmm. know. <laughs> Not sure they knew what they were getting into yeah. at the time, but that's how we slipped into Appalachia. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, we know that even you know, even adult mission trips have some some moments that are intended for for just for fun. Sure. And uh, I'm sure that. Well, on that 1982 trip, that was the year that the the uh, World's Fair was in Knoxville, Tennessee, mm -hmm. and so I planned it so that we could actually stay in one of the churches in Knoxville, mm -hmm. who were, by the way, raising money 
for their youth group by putting up youth groups that were coming to the, the, the World's Fair. Uh -huh. So we got to see the World's Fair on the tail end as we were coming home from Appalachia. We, we stopped and spent a couple uh -huh. of days at the World's Fair. Well, so let's, let's go to this idea of the mission trip to Mexico. How did you find out about that sort of thing and how did you start to present it to um, the church and the... That was really after my time. I did not do the Mexico oh, trip. You did not see... Oh, the, okay, the other mission trips, okay, back up there then. So you went to Appalachia and did, did you... Okay, that was, you said, about when? Uh, that was uh, 81, 82, 83. Okay, and you said you were here till 84? 84. 84 mm -hmm. Okay, so tell it what other... Uh, well, besides the local ones, which we did several times a, a year, we did local uh, service mm -hmm. projects here in Norman. Uh, there was a trip that was uh, planned into Kansas. Uh, I think there was a Mennonite community, and we went up and worked with the Mennonites. Mm -hmm. um, Appalachia was really where we spent most of our away service projects while I was here. I see. Did you go back to the same place several, several times? No. Uh, the first year was All Springs, Kentucky. The next year was Boone, North Carolina. And I can't remember where we went the third year. But basically in the Appalachian area? Yes. Mm -hmm. I remember one of the comments that, the, that one of the youth made when we got back to Norman as he was getting off one of the vans, he looked around him and he said, you know, I am wealthy. And that really stuck with me because you feel so wealthy compared to what you just seen. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So it was good, good for them to have that chance to uh, right. experience that. I have here a little certificate that you showed us. It says the ASP Miracle Award might read the rest of it too well, and tell us, tell us the story behind it. This is one of the funnies that happened on a trip. Um, we had uh, used three or four uh, SUVs, that we call them SUVs, now they were vans, usually mm -hmm. 12 or 15 passenger vans. Yeah. And uh, on our way to the work site, we'd all split up into different work sites as we left the gathering area. Uh, it was a rainy morning, and the asphalt was four or five inches high, and uh, old Royce got too close to the edge of the asphalt and slipped off, and the van tipped to one side, and it looked very precarious. Actually, it was never danger, uh, <laughs> but it, it caught us in such a way that I couldn't get out of it, and I had to call a tow truck to get us pulled out. But I have pictures in the group of the kids that were I got teased a lot for that. In fact, the organizer of this particular service project, there were youth groups from all over the country here, uh, awarded me the uh, ASP Miracle Award. It says running off a bank in a van and not tipping over and blah, blah, blah. So they, <laughs> I got their award for the week for that. <laughs> uh, well, while we're doing that, let's, let's, um, can you reach the plaque there behind you and then tell us the story of it? Uh, well, this was very kind. Uh, on my last uh, Sunday evening with the youth in 1984, uh, the youth presented me with a plaque, uh, and and many of them signed their names to it. And so. on the back it says, made especially for you, Roy Bendure, from the United Methodist Youth Fellowship of McFarland Memorial United Methodist Church in Norman, Oklahoma, 1984. As the signatures um, signed by Bob and Doris Aarons to the youth board, handmade. Oh, handmade. They, so the Aarons made it. Yeah. Okay. So and that's a has okay. the cross and flame in the middle and lots of signatures. I, I will say that many of these young people who are now in their 50s, because it's been a <laughs> while, 35 years, uh -huh. uh, are friends with me on Facebook. Oh, is that right? And we keep in touch, so I kind of keep in touch with what's going on. Yeah, I found Stephanie Pyle here, and I saw somebody else just a minute ago that I recognized. Bauman, Tracy Bauman. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes. it's interesting that uh, anybody looking at this, this can come up to our archives now. Roy is giving us uh, some of his memorabilia from his time with us, so you can come up and see how many people you can recognize. 
We already talked about some of the innovations that you did with starting the youth councils and, and of course, in, innovating the idea of uh, going somewhere on a, on a uh, mission trip. Um, I asked you if you'd be minded if we talked about Bill Chisso and you didn't respond with any objections, so I may assume that you tell us about becoming friends with uh, the Chissos. Well, I had known Bill since 1978 when we joined the searchers class. Uh, Bill was in that class and I always had a high regard for him and his uh, commitment to service and his deep faith. And um, 15 years ago, um, I had an occasion to lose another member of that class, David Anderson, mm -hmm. and was visiting with Jane Anderson, uh, his widow, and uh, Madge Chisso was there and had mentioned something that caught my attention. She said, well, Bill's going to have to start uh, the kidney treatments, the dialysis, unless he gets a kidney. And without even thinking, I said, well, I'll give him a kidney. <laughs> and then I thought, well, what have I just said, you know, and then I hadn't discussed it with my wife or anything, but as we did discuss it over the next few weeks, I was more in, in, intent on doing that. And how did she feel about it? She was fine with it. She was fine. And uh, Bill and I are sort of on opposite ends of the theological spectrum, uh, but we're one of those people, we, st we had lunch the week before his death, and uh, we discussed things, and we always respected one another, and it was never a bitterness or anything because we didn't agree. And uh, we went, went for the tests, and uh, we were close enough matched that my kidney was uh, of use to him, hmm. and uh, it lasted 15 years before wow. he... Uh, he often said his kidney was the healthiest thing about him because he had so many other health issues. Uh, one of the funny stories that we have about that is, is that we joked a lot prior to and after uh, the kidney transplant, and he said, Roy, if I get your kidney, am I going to act funny? <laughs> and I said, well, you might lean to the left a little bit. And that became our, our big story of, of all of that. Uh, he we took many times. To lift a little bit. And so it was in uh, 1980, what, that, that Bill had his transplant? Uh, well, let's see, 15 years ago. Was 15 years? 2004. Oh, okay, so it was more, more recent than I was yeah. thinking. Did Bill work with you um, in the youth at all? I think he must have. On occasion. Uh, yeah, I mean, when we had, especially he was he was there for any of the uh, service projects. He he was a, so dedicated to service. Yeah, and uh, all of his children were involved in the youth group. Uh, Michelle, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, was uh, was one of the earliest ones when I became youth director. She has on gone on now to become an ordained Methodist minister, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, Bill, his uh, Bill Jr. was a, a, an active member. Went to he and David, Michelle. They all went to the youth programs, all all the mm -hmm. uh, Appalachia service projects. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, in 1984, we did the Big England trip mm -hmm. for the John Wesley oh, tour. Oh, okay. That was sort of the mm -hmm. the high point of uh -huh. of that. No, the reason I, I was felt sure that I was thinking that Bill must have been. Uh, active with you in the, in the youth group when uh, when we told our son John that uh, that you had donated a kidney to, to Bill Chisso he, he was just absolutely you know, I don't know if you remember much about our son but he was I just did. absolutely open mouth he just he was just stunned and to get him to stun him like that is something but uh, he said I cannot believe it two, two people that were so important in my life at that time is that right and uh, yeah I do remember your son he was uh, very interested in model trains which I was as well mm -hmm. so I remember he was yeah we um, uh, talked about the youth ministry, and you've told us some stories. How long, you said you've held a position until the, uh, so 1984. And we, uh, the, the kidney transplant. We already, you already kind of hit on the idea, because like I said, as, as I was writing this question, I was just trying to think, how would you come to a decision to actually do that? And you gave us some 
some insight into that. Uh, is there anything more? That well, without going into to great detail, um, I had an abusive father, mm. and when I was quite young, I made a dedication that I would never be that kind of a person, mm. and uh, but was going to be the best father I could be mm. to my own sons, and. Uh, I felt like there were people in my life that helped me through some very difficult times as a young person, mm -hmm. and uh, that inspired me to to do that in return, if you will, to wow. uh, mm -hmm. um, to help somebody else as a repayment, to pass it forward. That's the simplest answer yeah, I can yeah. give you. Well, thank you for sharing that, uh, and it, it, imagine it helped that your wife was agreeable to letting you do that too. Yeah, she's very encouraging and she needed to be because there were some trying times. I imagine that. so. If I could tell the story about the uh, trip to England, mm -hmm. uh, that was the last big event that I was partly responsible for while I was here. Perry White was the uh, youth choir director, he was the adult choir director as well, and he and I were brainstorming one day uh, about 1983 uh, of uh, what he was going to do for a choir tour in 1984. Generally, his choir tours involved the, just the, the seniors uh, uh, in the choir oh, yeah. and mm -hmm. the youth itself who didn't participate in the music program didn't go on the choir tours. Mm -hmm. And so he was going to plan his thing that 1984 and I was going to plan either an Appalachia trip or something of that sort as mm -hmm. well. And it occurred to me that there were several things coming together here. First of all, uh, 1984 was the 200th anniversary of uh, John Wesley established Methodism in the United States. So it's a 200th anniversary of, you know, of Methodism here. And that why should we take separate trips? Why couldn't we combine a trip? and go to England and visit some John Wesley sites wow. in England. And we were, the, the idea just started to grow. And we thought, 1984, the church was on hard times financially. I, I believe I could, it's safe to say they were having trouble meeting the budget. Mm -hmm. And um, the economy at large was not going very well at that time. And we went to Phil with our idea thinking he was going to shoot it down Phil Finn mm -hmm. because of the money situation. And what surprised us both, he said, I think that's an excellent idea. Mm -hmm. Now the big problem next was we had to raise $35,000. <laughs> and uh, so from, I, I'm going to say probably in the fall of 1983 up till June of 84, we were busy fundraising, wow. doing everything we could think of to raise money. and. We had a lot of different ways to do that. And you did it okay. And we pulled it off. Wow. We took 50 young people and 10 adults to England, Scotland, and Wales. Wow. Uh, we did service projects while we were in England. We visited some nursing homes and elderly centers. Uh, and then the, the, the choir portion did concerts all over, you know, England, Scotland, and Wales. We visited Methodist sites. I have a picture of myself standing on Samuel Wesley's grave uh, because John Wesley wasn't allowed to preach in his own community because he, uh, he, he had to own property to preach. Oh. He, he owned no property there, uh. but he owned his father's gravestone. And so he preached from his father's gravestone. <laughs> oh. And I have a picture of me uh. with the Bible and I'm uh. preaching on the gravestone. <laughs> um, and we visited. Uh, many Wesley sites mm -hmm. uh, in London, particularly where the the fires touched his head. You know, uh, uh, he felt himself strangely warm. Oh, yeah. Do you know mm -hmm. that story? Mm -hmm. So that helped to uh, bring the kids into Methodism to think about how their roots went back all that 200 years wow. and so on. And we did some great service projects, and it was just a lot of fun as well. Mm -hmm. So you really laid a lot of groundwork for for the for leaders to follow uh, with taking youth on, on these major places that a few years before they would never have dreamed of trying to take bus right. full of kids all over the country or well, across I think, the, uh, overseas. I, I think the main difference was they took 
well, overseas maybe not, but they took many trips, but they were all more in the form of entertainment. Mm -hmm. And all you had to do was pay your money and you got to go. Well, we had an attendance requirement. Mm -hmm. uh, for the England trip, you had to attend X number of MYFs mm -hmm. and service projects and fundraisers. Mm -hmm. You had to be there helping to raise the money uh -huh. or else you weren't allowed to go. And so I think that made a difference. They really had to buy into the whole idea before they got to go on the trip. Mm -hmm. wow. Wonderful. Well, I'm trying to see if we have anything else that I haven't, but you, do you think of anything else we haven't talked about that, uh, that we should include? I'm sure there's a lot, all kinds of things. Uh, well, there, there are lots of stories. Uh, I think for me the, the strongest feeling I have is that uh, on Facebook these many of these young people are still in contact with me and I'm keeping up with them and they're keeping up with me and sharing stories. Mm -hmm. uh, just last week I had a, an hour-long phone conversation with one of them I hadn't talked to in 10 or 15 years mm -hmm. and it was good to catch up and mm -hmm. so wow. just knowing that they still want to be in touch is uh, very heartwarming. Yeah. And I, I don't remember, I, in fact, I don't really know exactly when, but I know that you are no longer in McFarland. That, uh, you mentioned being a Presbyterian before, and uh, uh, is there anything, anything about your, um, uh, how you're feeling about having left McFarland? Or, um, I, I had asked if you objected to my asking you that, and you didn't say no, so I figured that was open to ask. <laughs> well, that's probably a, a little touch here. I was... Uh, if, if it is, don't, don't bother. Uh, I was teaching the adult... The, the searcher's class for a six or eight month period and I offended some members oh. because uh, of my views oh. and uh, I got to thinking that maybe it was time to go back to our Presbyterian roots and uh, I found a Sunday school class at the Presbyterian Church who were more in line with my way of thinking mm -hmm. and uh, I taught over there for several years I see. so it, the, the one down right down the road yeah here. first Presbyterian mm -hmm. So, it was a very painful decision. Oh, sure. Like I said, our, always would be. our social group and our friends were in the Sunday school class, and Phil Finn, one of the most valuable experiences I've had was being to spend four years with that man. Uh, just, I, I couldn't get enough of him, you know, mm -hmm. he's so brilliant, and uh, he was a great friend to me in those four years, so leaving McFarland was very painful. Yeah, I imagine so. And you, uh, you were here for a little while after you had, uh, no, were no longer youth director, but you were here for a while after that. Oh yes, I stayed here until uh, 2000. Oh, okay, I didn't like realize that. that. Yeah. Were that you still Were you still here when when you donated the kidney to, to Bill? Uh, no. You were already out of McFarland. I was already out of left McFarland at that point. Well, Roy, you know one of the things that you did was turn that program around, which is what we wanted. And it made a difference because uh, uh, churches go old just like Sunday school classes do if you don't maintain your youth. And I think that's, you established a method of maintaining our youth. And today we've got a lot of kids attending. Well, that's, that's good to hear and you're very kind. But, mm. Have you been involved with any youth at all? At, um or just with Sunday school and other activities? I pretty much wore myself out after that. Uh -huh. uh, not so much, no. Yeah. Not, not even going in as a volunteer teacher for a lesson or two or anything like that? Uh, no, I really became, uh, I attended uh, Oklahoma City University while I was youth director. I, I earned 30 hours in religion while mm -hmm. I was on staff. Uh -huh. And I became fascinated with uh, uh, early Christianity, the roots of Christianity in the early years, and the, the Gnostics mm -hmm. and so on. And so once I got out of youth work, I started really reading oh. as much as I could get my hands on mm -hmm. uh, uh, about early Christianity. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I was sharing that with adults. That's a little bit deep, for I think, for the, for the youth. Yeah. I, I had Bible studies from time to time in my home mm -hmm. for the youth. Yeah. Um, but Basically, as far as my volunteer work with youth, it, it was pretty much over when I left McFarland. So, um, uh, what do you see for yourself in the future? Oh my. <laughs> I don't know if I put that on here. Uh, yeah, that's a trick question. <laughs> uh, well, I want to be um, 
as productive and as I can, um, as long as I can. Mm -hmm. I guess that's what I'm, I'm hoping for, make a difference. And I forgot to ask you at the beginning, you told me about, about marrying the preacher's daughter. I don't think you said, or if you did, I was didn't, I missed it. Do you have children? I have two sons. Mm -hmm. um, both of them were around when I was youth, was youth director. They were around the young people, but they weren't old enough to really participate at that uh -huh. time. Mm -hmm. However, when I did leave and um, uh, Myers became the youth director, mm -hmm. both of my sons became very active in the youth program mm -hmm. and stayed that way all through their high school years. Okay. And I have very fond memories of the youth program even mm -hmm. after oh, yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, if you think of nothing else and I think of nothing else and Joe can't think of anything else, <laughs> I guess we will say again, thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk with us. And we've learned so many things that we were not aware of. You, know, you can be here in the church all this time with these programs going on right here around you that, uh, and not be aware of really all that it involves. Oh, I forgot. You were going to tell about the uh, uh, when you had the, the boys and the girls both the same oh, yes. night. Oh, a memory came back to me when we came into this fourth floor room that I used to uh, have lock-ins. The lock-ins were one of the things that the youth councils chose that they wanted to do for entertainment. Uh, remember, I gave them choices of list of things, and mm -hmm. lock-ins always came up, and I always dreaded lock-ins because mm -hmm. there was no sleeping going on. I can guarantee <laughs> you. And uh, the junior high lock-in one year uh, was in this room. At nighttime, uh, I had the girls sleep on the third floor room be directly beneath us, and the boys slept on this room. I had adult women sponsors sleeping with the girls sleeping with in quotation marks <laughs> and uh, I was with the boys usually about six in the morning they'd wear down we had activities there were pool tables up here at one time and ping pong tables and so yeah. on and we had activities going on all night long and um, so they didn't really start winding down till like six in the morning which was about <laughs> the time we were trying to get them up but uh, one evening I was looking around and I thought wait a minute, there's some boys missing, and I uh, started counting heads, there were some gone. Well, I went down the outside stairs to the, th the room beneath us, and uh, the boys were uh, enjoying the girls' attention. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll leave it at that. And. Uh, and so I made the boys come back up here. I locked the doors and I put my sleeping bag right by the door of that exit over there so they'd have to step across me. And I slept very light for the short time that I, I was able to sleep. When we woke up in the morning to get them functioning, we'd have a breakfast. And um, then we would play a game that I called wake up or lose your socks. And they would have to sit in the middle with only their, you know, no shoes, they had their socks on. And then it was a free-for-all. Everybody had to pull as many socks off of everybody else as they could. And the person who had their one remaining sock on at the end was the winner. And that, that usually got everybody working oh, wow. pretty, yeah, functioning pretty well. We also had hunger weekends where we locked in and we wouldn't eat for like 36 hours. Mm -hmm. And we raised money for, for hunger mm -hmm. and then finished with uh, breakfast downstairs when oh, wow. Sharon raised. Actually, that morning, I think we had peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> and uh, one of the youth made a comment, that was the best peanut butter they'd ever tasted. <laughs> Memories like that come back to me as I see this room. Little by little, yeah, little yeah. by little. And you'll think of a lot more after we're finished. We'll think of sure. a lot more questions we should have asked you. <laughs> but again, uh, we just really appreciate your taking the time to come and talk with us and to tell us these stories that we didn't know right here and unaware of. Well, thanks so, for asking. Thank you. Thank you for being here. You're welcome.